Going to go ahead and call this June 4th, 2018 meeting of the Whitefish City Council to order. And I would like to ask Officer Veneman to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. We will move on to communications from the public, and this is time set aside to comment on items that are on the agenda but not advertised as a public hearing. We do have one public hearing tonight. Uh, anything you wish to share with the council, now would be your opportunity. Hi. And just name and address for the record, please. Okay. Thanks. Um, my name is Lindsay Ramadka. I'm an attorney with Conradi Anderson, 307 Spokane Avenue, Whitefish. Um, I represent the South Whitefish Neighborhood Association in regards to the Eagle Lake PUD application. Um, I am here tonight to specifically address the short-term rentals. First of all, I apologize that I am about to inundate you all with a lot of legal terminology. With all due respect to the zoning administrator, my client disagrees with his determination that B2 zoning does indeed allow short-term rentals. I am going to walk you through a little bit of our reasoning. Mary's much more thorough letter to you all um, will be even more helpful if you do have the desire to stay this proceeding and thoroughly digest it, as I suggest you do, as there is no time limit to approving a PUD. Um, w B2 zoning does not include short-term rentals as a permitted use. B2 zoning permits hotels, motels, and other hospitality and entertainment uses. Staff has interpreted short-term rentals in the definition of hospitality. However, the definition of hospitality does not include short-term rentals. Hospitality is defined as uses catering to the traveling public or the commercial, recreational, and leisure needs of visitor and resident alike, including hotels, motels, and um, various types of lodging accommodations. Various types of lodging accommodations is apparently where the zoning administrator um, determines short-term rentals fit. However, various types of lodging accommodations is not itself defined. Short-term rentals are explicitly defined in the Whitefish Code. They are defined as the rental of the entirely privately owned house, townhouse unit, condominium unit, apartment, or other residence for less than 30 consecutive days. Short-term rentals as defined herein do not include the following, bed and breakfast, hostels, and motel or hotel establishments. The fact that motels and hotels are excluded from the definition of short-term rentals but explicitly addressed as a distinct permitted use points to the fact that short-term rentals are not included in the definition of various types of lodging accommodations. Further, because short-term rentals is a defined term, it would have been included in the definition of hospitality, rather than various types of lodging accommodations. Thus, because short-term rentals are not included in the definition of hotels, motels, and other hospitality and entertainment uses, the council should condition this PUD on disallowing short-term rentals. Not only will prohibiting short-term rentals in this PUD align with the code, prohibiting short-term rentals also aligns with the goals and intents of the Whitefish Strategic Housing Plan and the Whitefish Area Workforce Housing Needs Resolution, which were adopted by you well before this application came along. Um, if the council does not want to make a finding on the definition of short-term rentals, and whether or not it is included in the definition of hospitality, the council can prohibit short-term rentals in this PUD application through its significant discretionary power. The application at issue is here because the applicant wants 60 residential condo units. Residential purposes are defined as the intent to use and or the use of a room or group of rooms for the living, sleeping, and housekeep housekeeping activities, a, of persons on a permanent or semi-permanent basis 
of intended tenure of one month or more. The only way to get 60 residential units in this particular scenario is through a PUD. A PUD is at the discretion of the council to approve. While the developer, by right, has the ability to have a motel or hotel, they do not, by right, have the ability to have a PUD that includes residential units with short-term ability. You, the council members, have the discretion to prohibit short-term rentals consistent with the PUD regs. The council has historically conditioned PUDs, and the council should continue to condition PUDs with reasonable and thoughtful conditions in keeping with the character of the community and the stated goals of white fish policy. In conclusion, I know many of you are worried about moving the ball on this applicant. However, city policies discouraging short-term rentals, encouraging affordable housing, and seeking to develop long-term housing solutions were adopted prior to this application. Council has always had the discretion um, to condition PUD approvals on legitimate conditions that advance the best interests of Whitefish citizens and respect the applicant's rights. We ask that you continue that tradition tonight and further, this condition, further condition this PUD approval on the denial of short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Who's next? <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Mary Flowers uh, with Community Unity Consulting, and I'm here tonight representing the South Whitefish Neighborhood Association. My address is P.O. Box 3094, Kalispell. Michelle, I do have some... Um, I do hope that you will pull this item off your consent agenda tonight and table it until such time as you have the opportunity to consider um, not only the comments that you heard at the public hearing on this matter, but the additional comments tonight um, and to have your staff uh, draft findings of fact that will allow you as they both, both your uh, city attorney and your planning director made it uh, clear at the last public hearing that you had the opportunity to um, condition this PUD to not allow short-term rentals. I want to walk you through, um, without repeating, which my letter does to some extent, uh, some of the comments that Lindsay just made on the fact that a Short-term rental is not a hospitality use and is not by right, um, therefore, allowed within the WB2 district. And that's the first couple of pages of my comments. Um, but I also want to point out that uh, we attempted last Friday to file an appeal with your planning office. Uh, Dave was out of the office, so I talked briefly with Wendy and then was able to talk briefly with uh, Angie about filing an appeal that with the Board of Adjustments and this was done um, a year or so ago if you remember the radio towers out in West Valley uh, the neighbors there filed an appeal which put that on hold and went to the Board of Adjustments which agreed with the neighbors that the determination the planning director was incorrect and the appeal was successful um, very similar situation we have here. Um, there's also a case a uh, number of years ago, uh, Beasley versus Flathead County, where the Board of Adjustments um, was asked to look at a determination by the planning director. Um, you did a similar thing recently with the Park Knoll Estates. Tom Turnow brought an appeal to you for the Board of Adjustments and uh, it stayed the proceedings. In that situation, the neighbors and the developer came to a uh, agreement and uh, withdrew their appeal and the development went forward. Um, 
However, when I attempted to file that appeal here on Friday, uh, Angie and in all due respect had very little time to uh, research this, but basically told me that she did not believe that uh, she could uh, authorize a stay on this uh, application before you tonight. Um, in all due respect, I think I've provided some case uh, situations here that she can review that I think would show that we should be entitled to that review. But more importantly, I think you have the opportunity to simply condition this uh, application before you and to resolve it um, much more simply. Uh, so I wanted to make those two points for you. Uh, in addition to what Lindsay uh, talked, walked you through in terms of the definitions, I wanted to point out that the planning office accepted the PUD application as a residential PUD. They paid a fee for a residential PUD. They were reviewed as a parking standards for a residential PUD. And from a fairness point of view, when you look at this, um, they were not rever reviewed as a commercial PUD. And as a commercial PUD, you would be taxed at, at a different rate than you w would be as a residential PUD. So when we talk about moving the goalpost, I think actually who is being most uh, impacted here is our existing lodging industry. Because the proposal before you is to allow 60 condominiums in a district that they would not be allowed in without a PUD, and you're getting no affordable housing. And I will go over uh, shortly in my comments how the whole pattern of development that you've approved in this quarter in recent years has not allowed short-term rentals and has, re and has gotten you affordable housing. So it's not consistent with what you've um, done. And I think to uh, condition this with short to deny short-term rentals would in fact be the fairest and most uh, prudent thing that you could do. Um, also, as you well know, your zoning regulations require that the applicant has a burden of proof um, to uh, support their application. Um, in 2016 and 2017, you adopted by resolution, um, and a resolution by the definition of the state codes means a statement of policy by the governing body or by the governing body that a specific action should be taken. <coughs> so you adopted policies well in advance of this uh, application before you. And I know staff has argued that the application is still under the old PUD regulations and it's still under the um, old short-term rental standards. But what it's not under is these uh, policies that you set in 2016 and 2017. And the burden of proof is on the applicant to show the benefit to this community of not complying with those. And they're not complying with them by not offering sh uh, affordable housing and by not demonstrating um, that condominiums are housing need that is uh, prioritized in those reports. Um, the applicant also failed to meet the burden of proof to establish how the PUD substantially achieves the intent of the PUD regulations and specifically how it meets the goals of preserving the character and qualities of the existing neighborhoods and provides affordable housing. The intrusion of short-term rentals as requested in the Eagle Lake Schumacher Plan Unit Development is not consistent with the pattern of development the Council has approved in the WB2 corridor over the last number of years. The views are Deer Creek at Whitefish. In 2005, the council approved 168 unit condo plan unit development, but conditioned it not to allow short-term rentals. 
that came back to you recently as an alto views for 166 town, townhouse development. And because of your prior conditions um, in that PUD, that development also does not allow short-term developments. In 2016 and 2017, the McKay Enterprise development, which was a very controversial development that came before you, eventually came back to you as a development that offered you affordable housing and no short-term rentals. Whitefish Crossing apartment units was a PUD. It was a 60-unit uh, application uh, for apartments, and all of the units were proposed as long-term rentals and uh, provided you affordable housing. So what you have in the e Eagle Lake P PUD would be the only development in this quarter in recent years from our review of the development proposals that does not include affordable housing and instead asks for, short -term unit sh for 60 units of short-term rental. The de denial of short-term rentals in this application is consistent with the residential uses that are required in the WB2 district. Um, under permitted uses for residential PUD, short-term rentals are not permitted. Um, under the variance deviations from standards, there is no standard to deviate to allow short-term rentals. Um, Go back because I think I skipped one session, one section. Um, so in short, we think that the um, most prudent thing for you to do, and in fairness to um, those who have invested in this quarter, um, have provided you short-term housing and have uh, limited the ability to do short-term rentals is to amend uh, this PUD to remove, to add a condition that short-term rentals are not permitted. We would also recommend that you remove the statement uh, which you are adopting as finding of facts in the staff report that says the WP2 zoning district permits all hospitality uses including short-term rentals and the application has indicated this is a potential for owners within the development. Um, we would encourage you to take your time to do this. Um, it's not necessary to do it tonight. Your PDD regulations clearly allow you to take additional time um, and to d develop uh, adequate finding of facts. Thank you very much. Oh, and I would just mention that the last page of this is just a copy of the appeal that we attempted to file. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Further public comment tonight. Rhonda. Good evening. Rhonda Fitzgerald, 412 Lubfer Avenue. Um, no legalese for me. Just kind of a layperson view. Uh, I have been involved over several years with a lot of discussion about uses in the B2 zone. And frequently the discussion has turned to uh, adding residential as an allowable use. And I have been very uncomfortable with that concept because I see it as a possibility for all kinds of things unintended to happen. Um, I think the most recent discussion, and it is in the affordable housing plan, is to look at adding residential in B2 with deed restriction for affordability. Um, and that would be the only residential allowed in B2. So, uh, <clears throat> and clearly the affordable housing plan also calls for reducing the number of short-term rentals in the community, not increasing them. And we do have several zones where they are allowed. So I feel that this is almost a contrarian application to what the community is trying to accomplish. Um, if we are to have residential in the B2 in the future, it would be very important to be sure that that's shaped to allow the things we're trying to foster. And I realize this is a PUD and you can have residential PUD, but to morph that into a commercial use, which is how these will be sold as, and you can short term rent them to help pay for them, will be uh, absolutely the opposite of what I think everyone is trying to achieve. So thank you very much. 
Thanks, Rhonda. Further public comment tonight? I'll go ahead and stay with the audience. Any volunteer board reports from the audience? How about the council? Richard. Um, <clears throat> the bike ped committee met this morning as we do uh, the first Monday of every month. And a couple of key points, we went through quite a long and lengthy agenda, but I think the uh, key points that I wanna bring up are that the uh, open streets in conjunction with the farmer's market uh, last Tuesday uh, appeared to be a huge success. Uh, they took surveys uh, while People were uh, using the streets and uh, visiting the farmer's market. Um, they got 60 surveys returned. Uh, the majority of people, <laughs> I, I know that uh, this is not gonna be well received, but uh, wanted to either weekly or monthly uh, closed and open streets. And I think that, uh, uh, but I think that there may be some possibility later on as we begin to study this, but hopefully we'll do it one more time um, this year. Um, the, it, it was a, a very positive bit of feedback. And secondly, uh, because it is always so popular that for folks to come to the uh, bike ped meeting as members of the public, the uh, next meeting will be July 9th, not July 2nd. So I want everybody to be sure to be there. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Frank, did you have a board report? No. no. Okay. Katie. This is a follow-up for the Whitefish Strategic Housing Committee. This afternoon and this morning, a group of people representing the Whitefish Housing Authority, the city and the Chamber of Commerce, including our city manager, Adam Hammett, met down in Helena with the Montana Board of Housing to present their initial low-income tax credit housing project. And I am pleased to tell you that they are moving on to the next stage in selection. So they're moving forward and their final presentation will be in August. And we look forward to helping work with the Whitefish Housing Authority. Thanks, Katie. Good news indeed. Further reports from the council? Not seeing any, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Any changes or additions to the May 21st, 2018 Minutes or a motion for approval? Richard? I do have some changes. Please. Um, in the minutes, uh, page 24, last sentence, uh, just the spelling, it's just a typo, Monaghan, M-O-N-E-G-O-N, -E change that to M-O-N-E-G-A-N. -E uh, page 28, first full paragraph, uh, change the word ration to ratio. Uh, page 28, the last paragraph, uh, core to core, that's spelled with an S. And on page 29, third paragraph, uh, it says it has a period and then lowercase here, that should be a period followed by T-H-E-R-E -E, as in there. Thank you, Richard. And then I have more. Please, if you want. continue. And um, I didn't intend to do this, quite this way this evening, uh, but um, I would like to pull Ordinance 1815 and 1816 uh, from the consent agenda. Um, with regards to 1815, uh, I would like to have um, a fuller discussion uh, and explanation of condition 21. Uh, so, because there was so much public involvement um, last time, just to have that uh, clarified. And um, with regard to 18-16, uh, I thought there were some significant questions and ideas brought up uh, during the public hearing, or not the, uh, but during public comment. And um, I know that there was a sense, or at least I sensed reluctance uh, on uh, the part of council when we approved uh, Ordinance 1816 on May 21st. Uh, I'd like to come back and circle back around on that. My preference moving forward be to first approve the minutes from the May 21st meeting as amended and then we'll have to address both 18-15 and 16 separately and with separate uh, motions. That's fine. 
You want to motion for the minutes, please? Oh, yeah. Uh, move to, <laughs> sorry, move to approve the minutes as corrected. Is there a second. second to the motion? Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, like sign, and that passes unanimously. Michelle, so we'll move on to item uh, 5B, which is Ordinance 18 15. If you don't mind, Richard, I was going to invite Mr. Dunker up to the podium and just name and address for the record, please. Um, Mr. Dunker did provide, I think, what we were expecting, which is clarification on the two types of housing products. Um, he included a flyer um, up at the dais this evening. Mr. Dunker, if you don't yep. mind, just. Jerry Dunker, going. 84 Armory Road, in Whitefish. If you don't mind, just walking through these two. Um, development uh, types just for clarification just of that condition one you gave. excuse me. Oh, okay oh that was wendy oh. yeah. okay take your time if you haven't seen that yet no, Mr. Yeah, I, I saw it um yeah so i think it's it's pretty much it's, this spells it out there's just missing uh primary residence i think on both sides maybe that was assumed in local workers um I'm, so, I'm, I'm not sure. Is there specific questions on this, or do you? Um, I just think the council was looking for final clarification on what was condition number 21 okay. when we adopted uh, okay. two I mean, weeks ago. I think the biggest part of it is it's still it's going to be developed by the housing authority and the city. This, this, these are kind of just examples from other deed restrictions that we've come come across from other cities. Um, so, you know, they're all. All of them will have primary and only residence, all 58. So no second home, no rentals. Um, one member of the household has to work in the city. It's going to be preference to that, working in 59937. Uh, resale of all the homes will be only to another qualified applicant, and that will be set by the housing authority or the city, wh whoever's in charge at that time, meaning they'll set the sale price. And I gave an example of a, a typical appreciation is 3% annually, but that's just an example. Um, so that's all 58 will have that and then half of them at least half of them will also have an income and an asset limit so and and I say at least the goal is that all of them will will fall into these six we kind of left it 50% just in case the demand wasn't there to fill them all that way and the other thing is like if someone does buy one and doesn't have the income and asset limits when they go to resell it, it could be sold to someone that does have that. And the Housing Authority could say, we have a list of people that qualify for all those restrictions. That's who we want to have it. So they're all going to be priced similar so that they can fit. I mean, th again, the goal is that all 58 will fall into the one that has the most restrictions. Yeah, we just kind of, the other 50 was just kind of, it, it's a unique development here. You know, based sure. on the needs assessment, there's going to be, you know, hundreds of people lined up, right? And if you look at Jackson Hole, for every one of these, there's eight people. It's a lottery system. But... They've been doing this a little longer than we have, so you know, we're just not sure of the demand right, right. now. Thanks, Jerry. Is that, is that clear enough, Richard? No. <laughs> no. no. Okay. Sorry. Because I, 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 th I think the public needs to, and I certainly need to know. Quite all right. Because if I look at the third bullet on the Trail View Housing, yep. this piece right here, uh, house A, and I appreciate you're doing House A and House B, Wendy. I appreciate that very much. Um, the initial sale price is market rate. Does that make it affordable or not? No, it's not. That's, I mean, I don't know what market rate would be for these, but it's really, it's, if you look across in our initial sale price serves area median income, they're all going to be priced to serve that income. Including House A and House B? Correct. So, the, so the, why doesn't it say that? I guess we just, I just, we just weren't clear about that. Well, so, so that therein is my, my concern because sure. two weeks ago, every house was affordable. Correct. Clearly yeah. House B fills that niche. Yep. There seems to be, at least in my view, sure. some discrepancy under initial sales <coughs> price. Yeah. So I'm trying to see what the actual condition and I understand that 21 was rewritten somewhat. 
And I, I want to make sure the public understands that sure. too. Yeah, it doesn't really spell it out in the rewrite either. It just says same thing, 50% will fall in that area median income. The, I mean, we base this all on the needs assessment and the strategic housing uh, plan that calls out the 80 to 50, 150% AMI is houses below 310,000. So if that's a number you want to put in there, we're, we're completely fine with that, all 58 homes. So you would be comfortable saying initial price serve area median income AMI 80 to 150% yes. over to house A? Yes. Include that in that column? Yes. Can we do that without a motion? that language um, modified before we, we vote on the second reading. Andy. I think, Mr. Mayor, we would just change the 50% to 100%. Isn't that correct? Seems like the easiest solution. So I would go ahead and move that if that's the direction we're heading, that under um, condition number 21, in both places where it's hang my computer Decided to slow down on me here. In both places where it says at least 50%, it would say 100% of 29 homes um, will be permanently affordable. 58 homes. Most, is that correct, Jerry? Is that 50, what we're saying? 58 homes. Yeah, 58. Yeah. So we say, so we say yeah, we just eliminate 29, put 58 homes. Correct. Good. Can you just rephrase that just for the record once more, Andy? Um, so it would have to read then 100% of the 58 homes will also be permanently affordable and must serve the population identified most needing single family homes making between 80 to 150% of AMI. Is there a second to the amendment for condition then number 21? Then we would have to delete the, um, the remainder of that. Yeah, I think. Okay. Yeah, the remainder Is of that. that we yeah. Want to delete the remainder of that. Yeah. yeah, or the remainder of that would, you know, fifty percent. Fifty percent of them don't have. It's a hundred percent of them. So. Yeah, and, and the, but fifty percent of them might not have the income or the asset limit. And I think I think eliminating that last sentence would be good because you know if we do a phase, say thirteen homes in the first phase, we want to get a hundred percent of those to be, the total, traditional deed restriction, so we don't want to have to try and fill in, fifty percent of those. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is there a second to Andy's friendly amendment to condition number 21? Second. We will vote on the amended condition, then go back to vote on ordinance 18-15. So we'll vote on the amendment now. All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign. And that amendment carries unanimously. Richard, anything further on this item? I, I just wanted to check in with Wendy. Does all that make sense to make that Slight modification for clarification purposes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That brings us back to the original, or we will need an original motion to Mr. approve. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Well, Melissa. I just wanted to clarify because House in the House B column it specifies six of the twenty-nine units will serve sixty to one hundred twenty-five percent AMI. So should that be carved out of that one hundred percent? It is under condition number twenty. Oh, okay. Got it. All right, thank you. Thanks, Melissa. We will need a motion to approve Ordinance 18-15 as amended. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would move that we approve Ordinance 18-15 um, oh, on a second reading. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign. And that carries unanimously. Michelle? Richard, I'll turn it back to you for Item 5C, Ordinance 18 16. We did. We did. We did. It's a simple request. It doesn't require a vote of the council. No problem. Um, I, as you know, I had some heartburn about um, this ordinance two weeks ago, um, and I think that some interesting 
points were brought up that I believe require some further study, uh, not the least of which is whether or not condominiums are, um, quote, hospitality uses. Um, I'm going to go back to some notes I took just a moment ago. Um, and that um, the, as I, well, let me back up. I think that both are, um, Ms. Ramadka, Ms. Flowers, and Ms. Fitzgerald, uh, all three brought up some areas and some things that should, in my view, uh, have further consideration. I would like to have time to discuss it further. And so my notion uh, would be to postpone uh, 1816 for further review, uh, particularly of um, STRs and the definition of hospitality use. Second. Second. Richard, would you like to address your motion? Uh, I think I did. Um, just I think that there are some issues that, that um, based on the reluctance, uh, the, the impression I got uh, when council voted that um, uh, they weren't completely comfortable with that decision, and uh, so therefore I'd like to uh, postpone and, and bring that back around for further discussion. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Frank. Are we moving it to a date certain, like next meeting? What, I mean, what are, have you thought through? I mean, limbo, limbo's a long time. It, it is. Um, and uh, I think two weeks should be sufficient time, David, perhaps, to uh, prepare um, either rebuttals to arguments or new arguments. Um, both ways, is that correct? Am I, am I okay? Am I on solid ground there? I think you're all right. Okay, two weeks. The next uh, council meeting. Before we go to a vote, I'd like to get our city attorney's opinion on uh, Mary's letter from last Friday and kind of the city's uh, legal position at this point on our decision from two weeks ago. Angie, if you don't mind. Sure, I'd be happy to, and um, I guess I can address the attempt to appeal Dave's staff report to the Board of Adjustment first, and then I'll, I, I guess I kind of like to reserve while Dave and I take a look at some of the um, arguments that were raised this evening with respect to conditioning the PUD. Um, so with respect to the Board of Adjustment, our code says that they can hear and decide appeals in which there's alleged there is an error in order requirement, decision, or determination made by the zoning administrator in the enforcement of these regulations. And Dave's staff report is just that. It's a staff report with a recommendation to council. Um, for instance, I think the best example I can give is when the firebrand CUP went through, Frank um, made a condition at the hearing that their rooftop would be used only as a patio. A year later, when they wanted to put a hot tub in, they came to Dave for a zoning administrative determination of whether or not patio meant they could have a hot tub. Dave said, no, patio means patio, and they appealed Dave's de determination to the Board of Adjustment, and that is really what the Board of Adjustment does. Dave isn't enforcing our zoning regulations and making a recommendation to council. He's simply taking the PUD criteria and applying it to the application. So I don't think it's appropriate to appeal to the Board of Adjust Adjustment. I don't think they have jurisdiction over it, and if they were to tell Dave, I think your interpretation, if you even want to call Dave's staff report an interpretation, is incorrect. I don't know where that would leave us, and we'd have a decision of the Board of Adjustment saying Dave's wrong. We've already, Council's already made at least a decision on the application on first reading, so I don't know what, it, I just, I think it lives this kind of in a procedural quagmire. I just don't think it's an appropriate procedural mechanism to appeal to the Board of Adjustments. Um, Mary cited to the Beasley case, and again, that was a case where the zoning administrator was enforcing the zoning regulations and determining that a CUP for gravel extraction remained with the property that the um, person purchased. So again, that's where Dave is actually making a decision with respect to a permit or something else that goes before the Board of Adjustment. Dave's staff report to you is a recommendation. I don't think we appeal can appeal staff recommendations to the Board of Adjustment, so I don't think it's an appropriate appeal. Um, with respect to conditioning the 
PUD on no short-term rentals, I think that's something Dave, Dave and I need to take a look at. And I think it's probably, you know, a valid point. I understand where Lindsay's coming from. And so I think that's something we'll need to take a look at. Okay. Thank you, Angie. Any further discussion of the council before we vote on this matter? And that's again to postpone um, to the meeting on June 18th, 18th, I believe it would be. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well, Michelle. We will move on to item 6A, which I believe will now be Ordinance 18-16, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Whitefish, Montana, rezoning approximately 7.5 acres of land located at 465 Armory Road in Section 33, Township 31 North, Range 21 West in Flathead County, Montana, from County SAG 5, which is Suburban Agricultural District, to our own Whitefish WCR, which is the Country Residential District and adopting findings with respect to such rezone on a first reading. Bailey. Hi, good evening. So the city is requesting a zone change on one parcel from County SAG 5, which is a suburban agricultural zone, to our WCR, which is our country residential district. The parcel is located along the north side of Armory Road. It's now within the city limits. Um, the purpose of the rezoning is due to the adoption of Resolution 18-11, which annexed the property into Whitefish city limits on April 2nd. Since it's now in the city, we have to change it from a county zone to a city zone. Um, so the purpose of the WCR district is, in, is for detached single family homes. Um, I did do a comparison between the WCR and the SAG 5 zone. It's on page 50 of your packet. Um, the property does total approximately seven and a half acres in size. Um, it is currently being developed with a residential dwelling, um, and the growth policy identifies the parcel as rural residential on our growth policy future land use map. Um, that does um, coordinate with our WCR and the growth policy says a WA-10. We don't have a WA-10 um, district, so the WCR is what is compatible with the rural residential. Um, the property is surrounded by uh, residential uses other than the railroad to the north, which is considered commercial or industrial. Um, uh, we did mail a notice to the adjacent landowners within 150 feet of the parcel on April 27th. Um, advisory agencies were notified and we did place it legal in the paper. I've had no comments submitted on the proposed zone change. I have had a few questions about possible future development of the site, but again, I can't say if they would come in or, or when or anything like that. So um, just kind of some general questions about future possibilities. Um, so going through so some of our criteria and the highlights, again, as I said, the growth policy future land use map does designate that as rural residential that does comply with the WCR um, proposed zoning. Um, the property is served by Whitefish Police and Fire Departments. Any new development would require um, to come into compliance with city requirements at that time. Um, public services and utilities are available along portions of Armory Road. So city sewer is located in the road. It's actually only approximately halfway through the, the parcel, so it doesn't extend all the way to the end of the parcel. Um, city water actually ends about 1,700 feet west of the property at the intersection of Dodger Lane. It's almost just off of the map, basically. It's the end of the Armory Park, pretty much, is where city water ends. Um, so this is currently being served by a, an individual well and septic system. Um, so the proposed zoning designation does include setbacks, maximum building height, any future construction would be required to come into compliance with current building codes. Um, it is served by Armory Road, that is a paved county maintained road. Um, at this time, even though we've annexed part of the road, um, until we have full annexation of the entire road, it's still maintaining or staying as a county road, it's not a city maintained road. Um, do, 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 do. The SAG, or the um, WCR is the closest equivalent zone that we have to the county SAG 5 zoning district. Um, the character is predominantly single family residential and the lot sizes are comparable and the proposed zoning, as I said, would be the most equivalent. Um, so, go back to my other page here. So staff recommended approval of the application to the Whitefish Planning Board. Um, they met on May 17th and considered the request. Uh, there was no members of the public that spoke at the meeting, and I did include the draft minutes as part of your packet. Um, and following the hearing, hearing, the Planning Board did recommend approval um, unanimously to adopt the staff report as findings of fact. 
and I can answer questions if you have any. Thanks, Bailey. Any questions for Bailey? Richard. Is there anything in this zone change that would preclude multiple homes on this lot from using a common well? I don't believe that is a standard that we have. I think it would come down to their, um, one, their water rate, I would imagine, and just their well with environmental health. Um, but I don't think we have anything in city code necessarily. Craig might know of something else, but I don't think we have anything in either the zoning or our subdivision regulations about that. Sorry, I thought you said common wall. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> common well. <laughs> like, I'm thinking, is that a fancy uh, term for a duplex? <laughs> um, yes, ultimately it would be reviewed by the county health department. Um, and I believe that DEQ would also weigh in on that and, and deny the ability for multiple structures to use the same well. Um, I, I can't say 100% for certain, but I know that um, on projects within city limits in the past that are not served by water, um, the county health department has ruled that only one structure may use the existing well. Okay. I was just thinking of a case down in Valley County subdivision. They were using wells and water rights and one thing or another in a very manipulative way. And been a pre-existing condition. Um, right now, the way that DEQ um, rule is interpreted is that any more than one structure on a, pub, on a well becomes a public water system. And for that, you need a whole bunch of other um, approvals from the state. OK, great. Thanks. Including, including a certified water operator to maintain that water system. So it becomes huh. fairly cost ineffective for two or three or four homes to share a well. OK, thanks. Thanks, Richard. Any further questions for staff? Not seeing any, we did advertise for what will be our own ordinance, 18-16, and we'll hold that public hearing now. Anyone wishing to provide public comment, name and record, or name and address for the record? Not seeing any, I'll close the public hearing and turn it back to the council. Andy. I would move to approve WZC 18-03, adopting fines, fact, and staff report as recommended to us by our Whitefish Planning Board from their May 17, 2018 meeting. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Sweeney. Further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like, sign, and that carries unanimously, Michelle. I just want to confirm that it's Ordinance 1817 and not 1816, since 1816 carries over with Trail View. It does? Okay, so 1817. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the clarification. We'll move on to item 7A, which is resolution 18-22, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Whitefish, adopting the Legacy Lands Advisory Council partnership responsibilities, working rules, policies, and operating guidelines as an addendum to the memorandum of understanding between the City of Whitefish and Whitefish Legacy Partners dated July 6th, 2011. Angie. All right, good evening again. I'm sorry, I feel like I've been talking at your guys' faces all evening. Um, my staff report is on page 93 of your packet. And as you all know, we have partnered for years and years with Whitefish um, Legacy Partners to create the Whitefish Trail. The city's role in the trail has been holding the, eases, the easements and licenses. And WLP has kind of been our boots on the ground in creating the trail and managing the trail. In 2011, we entered into a memorandum of understanding with Whitefish Legacy Partners. And under that MOU, we established um, the Legacy Lands Advisory Committee. And both the city and um, WLP appoint two members to the advisory committee. And the MOU made the LLC responsible for the development of the Whitefish Trail, utilization of the grant funds, and investment of donated funds to accomplish the um, objectives of the neighborhood plan. And while the 2011 MOU identified the general contributions that both the city and WLP would 
commit, it didn't specifically set forth each entity's um, roles and responsibilities. I think at that point we were kind of filling things out and trying to figure out how this would all work out. It did require the LLC to develop um, and adopt working rules and policies and, <clears throat> pardon me, to the city and WLP to develop a partnership agree agreement which would more clearly outline our roles and responsibilities. So now, seven years later, we are finally to that point and I would like to thank Katie so much for all the work that she put in on this document. She was really um, our city representative that realized this needed to be done and really spent a lot of time making sure that it happened. So thank you so much, Katie, for taking the lead in that. I know it was time intensive. Um, so at this point, we would like the council to adopt the um, partnership responsibilities, working rules, policies, and operating guidelines as an addendum to the 2000 MOU, 2011 MOU, as was contemplated by that document. Um, and again, the Whitefish Trail partnership responsibilities, which are in exhibit, um, really just, I think, are going to be instrumental in defining each entity's role as we go forward um, with this partnership. And we'll provide some clarity to, I think, staff on both sides about who is supposed to be doing what. Um, there's no immediate financial requirements or impacts of adopting the LLAC. Again, it just defines how things work on the ground. Um, in our 2000 MOU, the city, you know, their, our contribution is basically our professional talents of our staff. It is not tax, tax dollars. So that has not changed, but we think it'll create some clarity in going forward. So thought I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. And Maria, I'm sure, has a little bit better idea on the ground of how it's working. So thanks, Ange. Any questions for staff? Not seeing any. Thanks for the staff report. And thanks, Katie, for all your work on this. Motion? Yes, I'd like to make a motion, and I can speak to that briefly if need be. Um, I move to approve revolu well, revolution. <laughs> resolution 18-22, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Whitefish, Montana, adopting the Legacy Lands Advisory Council partnership responsibilities, working rules and policies and operating guidelines as an addendum to the memorandum of understanding between the City of Whitefish and Whitefish Legacy Partners dated July 6, 2011. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second. Seconded by Melissa. Katie, would you like to speak yeah, to the motion? Just briefly, I think Angie did a really great job explaining the purpose and the reason why this is before council today and the citizens. We have a very wonderful partnership with Whitefish Legacy Partners, but as the Whitefish Trail continues to grow, we need to make sure that the people who are here may not be here 10 years down the road. And while we all know this inside and out and how it runs and how it should operate and where everyone should clearly define their roles and responsibilities, I think it's good to have it in paper and have everyone be aware of what each partner's responsibility should be. And so this is just a clarification and something that people can then look back on. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Further discussion, comments? All those in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. And those opposed, like sign, and that carries unanimously as well. Michelle brings us quickly on to item 8A. You have Adam's written report and close with the packet. As Katie mentioned earlier, Adam was traveling to Helena today, so he was unable to join us this evening. So we really can't ask him any questions, but I'm sure Dana could possibly answer any questions you may have. Not seeing any questions. We'll move on to item 8B. Um, staff, are you aware of any other issues that arose between May 29th and June 4th, you need to report on. I don't have any, but I'd just like to remind you about the meeting next Monday. I know it's in a staff report, but we'll be starting at 5.30 and the agenda will follow this week. Great, thanks Dana. We'll move on to item nine, communications from the mayor and city councilors, and we will start with Richard tonight. Um, sorry, just take, sorry, I was just taking a note. Sure, take um, your time. No, the only thing I want to do is uh, give out a, a shout out to Katie uh, for all her hard work on the LLAC. Um, I know that that's, that's been something you took on when you first got on council, and um, it's one of those almost thankless committees sometimes, and, uh, but you've, you've done a great job and served the city well. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Andy? Uh, just a couple of things. I didn't bring it up during the... Uh, um, 
committee reports, because I guess it's kind of a committee, but we did have our kickoff meeting, as you noticed, in Adam's report for the Highway 93 or Spokane Avenue section, and which I thought, Craig, went pretty well for the most part. Um, the one takeaway I did get from there is there's going to be two things that are going to be critical. One, we can collectively get our community act together and come up with a design for that. Because the longer we wait, the longer it takes us to get into the funding cycle. And the longer it gets into the funding cycle, the worse the traffic and the mess gets. And we would be probably five years out at best if we say, could say tomorrow, this is what we want. Um, and I also took away from that that, I mean, I thought the state, they were very amenable. They're like, we're not going to do something the community doesn't want. But they also said that when we go for federal funding, we have to at least be able to demonstrate that it's going to work for 20 years and there's going to be at least some amount of level of service improvement. I don't see that what we have in the downtown master plan from the Crandall and Rambula program that we have that currently, so something we may have to revisit. Um, another night I thought was great, um, and we're going to try and work as diligently as we can through the summer and keep moving forward. Um, I have one other thing as long as we're heading into wedding season here. Um, <laughs> The Lodge has all of their weddings mostly outside in a tent. They're generally quiet by 10 p.m., but they have three to four weddings a week, sometimes two weddings a day, and all of that noise basically broadcasts all over everyone that lives in Mox Bay. And while I realize we're supposed to be quiet at 10 o'clock, but it's a problem for the neighborhood there, and I think there's been some issues between the lodge and some of the neighbors individually, and I'm not quite sure how we deal with that, but I think we kind of maybe need to put them on notice that they need to really think about how much sound they're pumping out over the water all summer long, because it is obtrusive, and people want to enjoy their backyards, and they're listening to the driving DJ beat for <laughs> all of Saturday afternoon and all of Saturday night. And it's, it's a tent and they have a lot of sound in it and it's on the water. It just doesn't work. So I don't know what we do about it, but it seems to me there's something that they could do inside to at least put up some kind of sound walls or something to kind of knock it down. It's worth on the south side of the bay. People to the north are a little better because there's buildings and more trees, but anyway, before, because we're going to have a problem at some point this summer, so I don't know, Dave, if we send them a letter and say, look, we're coming into wedding season, can you tone it down or something, I don't know, so. I can call Brian Averill and talk to him about it. Yeah, and I've talked to Brian too, but it, that's just me, and I'm but one voice up here, so that's it. Thanks, Andy. Katie. No comment. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Frank. The lodge isn't the only one that does it. Grouse Mountain also gets carried away, and it carries all the way over. Uh, it doesn't happen often, and when I've called them, they've been very good about um, almost, you can almost hear the song go down. The, the phone call hits, and it's like somebody goes in and turns it down, but that doesn't always happen. But it, uh, it, we're in that season, I guess, maybe a reminder to some of our hospitality uh, operators that they need to manage that would probably be a good thing. Thanks, Frank. Melissa. Just want to remind everyone it's primary day tomorrow. So for everybody here and out in TV land, if you're watching or internet land, get out and vote if you haven't already. Thanks, Melissa. I just had one item, our upcoming retreat, which is June 21st and 22nd. Everyone's still on point to attend so far. And preferences. So we have the facility pretty much booked for the 21st, the evening of the 21st and the 22nd. We need to, I think, be out of there by Friday about 4 or 5 o'clock for another group. What's your preference on when you'd like to start and end? I don't think we obviously need two full days. We could either go up the morning of Thursday, June 21st and wrap up the following morning, or we could go later on Thursday and work through Friday. Just kind of want to get something nailed down here. My preference would be to go Thursday and uh, get out of there Friday morning. I've got commitments Friday afternoon. Okay. Is, is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Sure. Perfect. Well, is that okay with you, Frank? I, and 
Yeah, I, I would go early. I, the earlier I get out of there on Friday is better for me. So whether we, I can manage anything, but earlier is better. Okay. So why don't we plan on 10 o'clock arrival on Thursday, and we'll try to get out by 10 the following day if that works. Great. I think that's all I had. Anything further from staff? How about the council? We're adjourned. Thanks.